So you can press record where we're going? Okay. All right, so I'm going to start by, give it, by doing yet one more example of the addition of angular momentum, uh, or angular momentum, I guess I should say. Um, this is the case uh, that's, that occurs all the time in atomic physics, namely, if you simply have an electron, then it's going to have both orbital angular momentum and this intrinsic spin. Um, of course, we keep talking about this spin, but just between you and me, I don't think anybody understands what electron spin actually is. So that's a big embarrassment, which we'll just pass over because we can handle it mathematically, and it's in agreement with experiments. Um, so let me just mention, by the way, I've started to put the second homework assignment on the web page, but I only have one problem up so far. I'll, in the next few days, put up some other problems. Um, in case you wonder what that funny square root is, just remember that uh, j plus or minus is j1 plus or minus i j2, and so j plus j minus which is J1 plus I J2 times J1 minus I J2 is equal to J1 squared plus J2 squared and then minus I J1 J2. But the commutator of J1 J2 is I H bar J3. So this is equal to total J squared minus J3 squared uh, plus uh, H bar J3, right? And uh, consequently, taking the matrix element of this in the state Jm, uh, which is the same thing as the norm of the state J minus on Jm squared, what we get is simply h bar squared times j, j plus 1 minus m squared plus m. And um, so that tells us then that j minus on jm is h bar square root. I, I realize that we've seen this before, but this is the tricky, this is just the thing that's not really easy to remember. J, that's supposed to be a comma. M minus one. And this square root is also um, J plus M, uh, J minus M plus one. Okay, so that's how you remember the norm. Uh, I was actually doing one of these problems and I didn't have that formula within reach, so I just derived it that way. I just thought I'd mention to you that it's not really mysterious if you can find it in that way. So, an electron, or for that matter, a quark or a neutrino, uh, will have automatically an orbital angular momentum described by an operator L and a spin angular momentum described by a the spin operator, which is just h bar over 2 times the Pauli matrices. And its uh, angular momentum eigenstates are Lm, direct product with 1 half plus or minus. That's uh, the clearest way to think about them. On the other hand, the total angular momentum, J plus L, has, we have eigenstates of J squared, J3 or JZ, L squared, and S squared. And these states, I'm just going to write now as JM, and of course they'll really be J, M, uh, L, and um, 
one half. But the L and one half and one follows are going to be spectator variables because they're not going to change. Uh, and these have eigenvalues, of course, J squared on Jm is H bar squared J, J plus one Jm, and Jz, say, Jm is H bar M. Oh, I'm lapsing. Um, I'm going to use capital letters for the capital letters for the uh, combined quantum numbers J squared and J3. Um, and then, of course, L squared on the state JM will just be H bar squared L, L plus 1 JM, and um, S squared on this state will just be H bar squared times 1 half. One half plus one, and this thing is three quarters. Each part of the did all. Okay, so that's uh, the basic idea. The top state, the biggest state, is, uh, the state of highest J and highest M is clearly going to be the state over here that's going to have m equal to l and spin up. So this thing is the state. Uh, and that will give, so let me see, let me write it then as l, l crossed into one half plus, and this is going to be l plus one half comma uh, l plus in the quantum, so in other words, J, the value of quantum number J is L plus a half, the value of M is L plus a half. So that's the top state. And now we're going to just act on it with J minus. We use this mysterious square root, and we get down, we find, a, we find out what the lower states are. Um, I put these notes, by the way, on the web page last night. So what we get, I don't know quite where to start this thing. Um, J minus then on L plus a half, L plus a half, and by this, this is what I mean as Jm, is going to be equal to h bar square root. And if you do the arithmetic here. Um, this of course the arithmetic I screwed up in the early part of an earlier lecture. Uh, you get 2L plus 1 times L plus a half L minus a half. So this identifies this state once we say that this is the same thing as L minus plus S minus acting and it's acting on the state LL one half plus, which is what this thing is. Okay. And so that is equal to L minus on LL times one half plus plus LL S minus on one half plus. And that is equal to, it turns out, again, if you use the square root formula and do the arithmetic right, square root of 2L, L, L minus 1, 1 half plus, plus L, L, H bar, 1 half minus. This was the arithmetic that I got wrong last time. Um, Okay, so what does this tell us? This tells us that this state here can be obtained by dividing all this by h bar and this square root. And 
And so what we get, maybe I'll be able to use, uh, what we get is L plus a half, L minus a half, is equal to 1 over the square root of 2L plus 1 times square root of 2L, L, L minus 1, 1 half plus, plus L, L, 1 half minus. All right, so this fraction, this divided by that is one fletch, and one over the square root is another fletch. Any questions? By the way, I'm going to ask, uh, I, I had dinner with a new member of our faculty who specializes in teaching techniques, and I, over dinner, said to him, uh, boy, having trouble getting the students to ask questions in class. And he said, well, try the minute question. And the minute question is that at the end of the hour, I want you each to take a piece of paper and write down a question. Don't sign your name or anything, just an anonymous question. And then pass them forward, and I'll try to answer them at the beginning of next class. Uh, calls those things a minute question and uh, presumably have a minute to work out the question that I compute time to that accuracy alright so uh, we can just repeat this though now we know what this is so we can act with J minus on it and so we act with J minus on L plus a half L minus a half, and again using this square root formula up here, uh, what we find is that this is h bar square root of 2L times 2, L plus a half, L minus 3 halves. So, um, let's see, maybe I should do explicitly the uh, arithmetic in one of these. So in this case, this is J and that's M. So J plus M is simply 2L. And then J minus M is just 1. Plus 1 is 2, so that's the 2. This is the 2L and uh, J minus M plus 1 is the 2. Okay, that's how that thing works. And now, that, of course, is equal to, since J minus is equal to L minus plus S minus, that's equal to that on this state L plus a half, L minus a half, and that's all this stuff. So we have a 1 over the square root of 2L plus 1, square root of 2L, L, L minus 1, 1 half plus, plus L, L, 1 half minus. Okay, so this is then... 1 over the square root of 2L plus 1, square root of 2L, L minus on L, L minus 1, 1 half plus, and this really only acts on that. And then we have plus square root of 2L, L, L minus 1, and then S minus on 1 half plus, and then we have L minus on L, L times one half minus plus L, L S minus on one half minus. Okay. All right. What is S minus on one half minus? Right. 
it's zero because it would have to lower this value of minus one half, minus ten to the minus one half, down to minus three halves, but a spin of one half particle doesn't have a state of minus three halves. Anyway, we proved that that was zero in the previous lecture. So this thing is zero. Um, this one, we've already figured out what this does. S minus on one half plus is just equal to one half minus. So this thing here plus this thing uh, will add up because, in fact, um, we saw over here that L minus on LL is square root of 2L, L, L minus 1. Anyway, so all this gives us that this is equal to 1 over the square root of 2L plus 1 uh, square root of 2L. Did I leave out some H bars? I think so. Yeah. Um, Are they in the notes? Wow, I left them out in the notes too. Okay, got to fix that. Anyway, there are H bars all over here. In fact, what I can do to cure it is just put an H bar over here. <coughs> so I'm just going to pull that H bar. The J minus always generates an H bar. Well, I'll just give you the general rule. L plus a half M, which is the combined state, JM, is 1 over square root of 2L plus 1, square root of L plus big M plus a half L M minus a half, one half plus, plus square root L minus M plus a half, L M plus a half, one half minus. Okay. So those are the general states. And M ranges from, well, the top value is L plus a half, when the spin is up and the overlying momentum is, you know, the electron is basically going like that. Uh, 
L minus a half, dot, 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 minus L plus a half, and then minus L plus a half. So those are the possible values. These are the states, though. All of these states have the maximum possible value of J. Remember, when you add two angular momenta together, the value of J is less than or equal to J1 plus J2, and greater than or equal to the absolute value of J1 minus J2. And in this case, then, it's less than or equal to L plus a half, and greater than or equal to L minus a half in absolute value. And so if L equals zero, then there's just one value of J. And the angular momentum is totally due to the spin. If L is equal to one, then you can have J equal to L plus a half, which is three halves, or you can have J equal to L minus a half, which is one half. So you can have spin three halves and spin one half. So the angular momentum three halves and one half for the total. When L is equal to two, you can go all the way up to J equal to five halves, and the lowest value you can have is three halves, which is two minus one half. So that's, but here, we've only been looking at the states L plus a half. Now the states L minus a half, you think, oh God, we're going to do this again, we're going to have all these square roots. But in fact, it's very easy to figure out what the answer is for all of the states uh, L minus a half M. And what you do is you just use this trick. You want these states to be orthogonal to these states, but to have the same value of the Z component of angular momentum. Well, that means they have to have the same, they have to have the same pairing here, M minus a half plus, and M plus a half minus. So it's just a linear combination of these states, but with different phases. And what you do is if you, so this is the general trick. If you have a, and of course this state is perpendicular to that state. So if you have a state um, X A plus Y B, where A and B are orthogonal, and you want to stay perpendicular to that, all you do is write Y A minus X B. So that if this is state one, then state two is that. And that's automa it automatically works. To see that if they're orthogonal, just notice that two one is equal to uh, X Y star A A minus uh, I'm getting minus x star y b b. Um, okay, so I think I, uh, because these were real, I didn't uh, bother to figure that out. So let's just put stars uh, here. And then when we take the complex conjugate, we're going to get rid of these stars. And so this is x, y times 1 minus 1, which is 0. Okay. So in other words, you just take, you interchange the two coefficients, complex conjugate them, and give one of them a minus sign. Okay. Now, um, obviously there are many states any state with the same, any state with a that's proportional to this with an arbitrary phase would still be orthogonal. And so, um, with some arbitrariness, the convention is that the coefficient of the state m plus a half should have a positive coefficient. That's just the convention. And so let me, with no further ado, write down what they are, then these states are L minus a half and 
1 over square root 2L plus 1. So we take this coefficient here, I'm sorry, this coefficient and put it in front of this state. So we get square root of L plus N plus 1 half on L N plus 1 half, 1 half minus, minus square root L minus N plus 1 half L N minus 1 half, 1 half plus. So those are the other states. And this convention, the idea here is that you sort of have, you give J1 a privileged state. J1 is L in this case, and J2 is 1 half. And um, so since it's privileged, the case where it keeps all of its Z component of angular momentum, that one you give the plus sign to, and the minus sign to the other, and then you're obliged to switch the, to uh, switch the two factors. And of course, what I did was I moved this one up and that one down. And again, M, M now only runs though from L minus a half, L minus three halves, dot, 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 minus L plus three halves, minus L minus a half. It, um, Because the maximum value of j, of course, is, is the value of j is L minus n. All right, is, is, does anybody have a question about these problems, or the, this technique? In any event, it's clearly, um, this is clearly an important example. All right, now I think I'm going to basically say that's it for angular momentum. I mean, we're of course going to use angular momentum, uh, but that's the basic idea. I want to go in on now to the two-body problem. Um, many lawyers go into divorce law and make a lot of money on the two-body problem, but um, this is a this is a physics case. Um, so the typical two-body problem has a potential that is some potential of R1 minus R2. In other words, and here I'm, uh, we're in the context of non-normalistic physics, so the idea is that we have a potential that depends upon the distance between the two particles, the two bodies, and um, In general, it may even depend upon the direction. And the Hamiltonian then is P1 squared over 2m1 plus P2 squared over 2m2 plus V R1 minus R2. So this is the general case of the two-body problem. Now the question is, um, what do you do? Are you really going to be dealing with um, uh, R1 and R2 when you know that what you're going to do pretty soon is you're going to use relative coordinates? Uh, so the first thing you do is you say, well, P is P1 plus P2. So this is the total momentum. Okay. That's the total momentum. Now, what we'll see soon is that P, in fact, commutes with the Hamiltonian. Because the Hamiltonian only depends upon the distance between them, between the two. Uh, we'll see that in a minute, or in fact, we could see that immediately. So let me jump out of line here and, and show you that. Clearly, since P is P1 plus P2, it's going to commute with the kinetic part. Total P is going to commute with the kinetic part because P 
commutes with P2, P1 commutes with P1. So what's the problem? The issue is, does R1 minus R2 commute with P? And indeed it does. Let's try to show that. That's important. Maybe I'll start over here. R1 minus R2, comma, P1 plus P2, this commutator, and all these guys are vectors. So this is equal to, clearly R1 and P2 commute, and R2 and P1 commute. So this is simply R1, P1, minus R2, P2. And now, and of course I've got this crazy vector equation. So what I really mean here is, take the i component of this and the j component of that, and that would be i h bar delta i j minus i h bar delta i j, which is zero. Okay, so I've used sort of a hybrid notation, but you can see that, in other words, take sub i j, i j, i j, the i component of R, j, j component of P. So in fact, the total momentum, so R1 minus R2, commutes with P. All the components. Okay. And that's good, because you expect, in general, this generates translations in space, this generates translations in time, and they should commute. Now, the tricky part comes in defining the center of mass, which is M1 R1 plus M2 R2 over M1 plus M2. So this is just the center of mass coordinate for the object. And then, of course, we're going to do what you knew we were going to do from the beginning. We're going to write a relative R as R1 minus R2. And we're going to talk about a relative momentum. And the relative momentum is a little bit tricky. It's M2 P1 minus M1 P2 divided by M1 plus M2. That's a bizarre sort of thing. But what's good about it is the following, that Ri Tj then is R1 I minus R2 I commutator M2 P1 J minus M1 P2 J, all that divided by M1 plus M2. Now, in this commutator, R1 only cares about P1, and so that's going to be I H bar M2 delta I J. And then R2 only cares about P2, so the minus signs cancel, and we get plus I H bar M1 from over here delta I J divided by M1 plus M2. And so this is just I H bar delta I J. So these variables, R and P, are canonically conjugate. That is to say, their commutator is I H bar delta I J. And that's the reason for the weird choice. All of these guys, all the other variables are normal. I mean, who could argue with them? The one that's weird is little P. And the reason why little P has this funny form is so that you get this value, this commutator. And in fact, its funny form gives us one more 
advantage, namely between QRI and QJ. Then what we get is M1 R1I plus M2 R2I commutator M2 P1J minus M1 P2J. So that's a 2. And that's divided by M1 plus M2 squared. Okay, so this is M1 M2 times this commutator, which is pi H bar delta IJ. And then you have minus M2 M2 M1 delta IJ pi H bar. You've got all this divided by that, and that's just 0. So big R and little p commute, which is the most important thing you want then. On the other hand, big R and pj, this gives us M1 R1I plus M2 R2I commuting with P1J plus P2J divided by M1 plus M2. And so these are little p's, okay? I sometimes carry away here. Let me take this away. So R1I commutator P1J is IH bar delta IJ. So that's M1 IH bar delta IJ. M2 with P2 is also IH bar delta IJ, but now M2. And all of this is divided by M1 plus M2. And so the answer is IH bar delta IJ. So big R, the center of mass, and the total momentum are canonically found here. And of course, that's exactly what we want. And then finally, what I just proved here was that the relative RI with big PJ is zero, and that's exactly the thing I proved at the beginning. So that's, so these are the nice variables. And it turns out that if we take this expression here, obviously B becomes B of just little r. But this structure here, it turns out, is just the following. That H is, in fact, big P squared over 2 big M, where big M, of course, is M1 plus M2. And then plus little p squared over 2 mu, where mu is the reduced mass, plus V of little r. And mu is the reduced mass, which is M1, M2 over M1 plus M2. Now, I skipped showing that, but that's going to be a homework problem. Of course, it's hardly a problem. If you can, you can find, you can either do it yourself or you can look it up on the web somewhere. This mu, if the masses are the same, if M1 is M2, then mu is, let's say that M, and this is M squared over 2M. So this is M over 2. So that's why it's called the reduced mass. It's smaller than the normal mass. In the case of the hydrogen atom, mu is equal to MEMP over Me plus MP. And now if you divide by MP, you get Me divided by 
1 plus Me over Mp. Well, Me is half an MeV. Mp is around 940 MeV. And so this is just like 1 over 2,000. So the thing is reduced by something like 1 part in 2,000 for the case of the electron around the hydrogen. OK, are there any questions about that? All right, now, the, now that we've got the Hamiltonian in this form, uh, it's clear that big P with H is equal to 0. Big P R sub I with H is equal to 0 because we've seen that uh, P commutes with big P. Where, where is that? It's somewhere in here. Curious, don't have that down there Well, maybe, well, maybe that was, I just thought of that as trivial. Um, the reason big P commutes with little p, in other words, PI, little pj, of course, is nothing more than P1I plus P2I with and then this funny linear combination of P1 and P2. So let me just call it Pj. That's zero because this is just a linear combination of P1 and P2 and P1 and P2. So that's, that's that. So the momentum commutes with the Hamiltonian. And of course, the key part of this, the part that I emphasized before, is that it, is the big P commutes with V because this only involves the relevant variable. So the, so the key thing here is the R I P J. Okay. On the other hand, we know that the equation of motion is for the relative coordinate is I H bar R I dot is R I commutator with the Hamiltonian. And the commutator R I with the Hamiltonian is going to just involve P, this P there. And so that's going to be uh, 1 over 2 big M R I with P squared. And that turns out to be I H bar big P I over M. Uh, so you know how to do the commutator of A with B squared is it's a commutator of A B A B B plus B A B and um, these guys are going to be high bar P I and then there are two of them so the two cancels. Um, what this tells us then is that <coughs> excuse me that the that I H bar R I dot is I H bar pi over m, but pi is time independent because it commutes with the Hamiltonian. And so we can integrate that immediately to ri of t is equal to ri zero of zero plus pi over m times t. So the, the, the center of the, the Two bodies, the center of mass of the two bodies just moves in a straight line at a constant of speed, pi over p over m. The total angular momentum L is L1 plus L2, which you can write as R1. So I'm just thinking of spin now. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking of orbital now, ignoring spin. So it's R1 cross P1 plus R2 cross P2. And I'm going to make this a homework problem, namely showing that this is R cross big P plus little r cross little p. So that's the, that's the um, total angular momentum. It's uh, the orbital angular momentum in the center of mass. 
and that is constant. Now, why is that constant? This R changes. It's constant because the way in which the time-dependent part of this is, in other words, this is R of 0 plus T over M times T, cross product, not a commutator. Cross product with big P, and P cross P is 0, so the T-dependence cancels. So R cross P is a constant. And so we're just left with R cross P. And whether R cross P is a constant depends upon what this is. In other words, if this is a function only of the distance, only the length of that R, then R cross P, little r cross P, will also be a constant. It will commute with this. But if this is a vector, if the dependence is vectorial, then R cross P will be a constant. All right, so that's the end of that. These notes are also online. So are there any questions? We're chewing up a lot of material here. All right, let me jump now to the main application of this. The main application of this, of course, is that we've got this H, which is the form P squared over 2 big M plus this structure. And so we can say that H is equal to big P squared over 2 big M plus P squared over 2 mu plus B of R. And these are all vectors. Now, what one says then is that since P is a constant, I guess we can just call K is equal to P squared over 2 M. And we can then say that this is sort of big H is equal to that. Unfortunately, I don't have another. Maybe I should call this H. All right, I'll write this as H B for big. And so then I can say H B is K plus little h. And little h here is going to be P squared over 2 mu plus B of R. And so this is the part that's the hard part that one needs to solve. And now the case of central potentials is the case in which B of R is only B of the length of R. And in other words, there's a symmetry, namely that the central potentials central potentials, the idea is that the Hamiltonian should commute with R cross P. And so that means that B of R should commute with R cross P. And so B of R is just B of the distance. And that's the case for, that's approximately the case for hydrogen because the vectorial part comes through by the magnetic moment of the proton and so forth. And the interaction of the spin with the magnetic field of the nucleus and so forth. And it was a very small effect. So the first thing to do for a central potential problem is to consider the case, is to work out this case. So that's what we're going to be looking at. And now, if we were Greek, I would keep this mu here. But we're, as far as I can tell, none of us is Greek. Some of us might have Greek, partly Greek. But 
anyway, Greek's not our native language. So I'm going to switch to simply h is p squared over 2m plus v of r. This is just the distance, and I'm replacing u by m just because it's a Latin letter. And so, as we've seen here, h commutes with L sub i, where L sub i is uh, r cross p sub i, which of course is uh, x1 i j k r j p k. So, um, well, that equals zero. That's not necessary. Um, so, we, have, we can diagonalize then h H commutes with, in particular, LZ or L3. And H also commutes with L squared. Um, so we have uh, three uh, eigen um, By the way, the reason why H, since H commutes with L, it obviously commutes with L squared, okay? But the L's don't commute with each other. In other words, L I, L J is, of course, I H bar, X one I J K, K. And so we need to pick one of the L's to diagonalize. So our three uh, compatible commuting permission observables are H L3 or LZ and uh, L squared. And as we know then the values of of LZ will be we'll, we'll call these things um, when we call them NLM this will be H bar N NLM L squared on NLM will be H bar squared L, L plus 1, NLM. And then we'll be saying the E, uh, and in general E, well, let me see, what I want to be saying is H on NLM will be E of NL. Uh, e doesn't depend upon M because um, H commutes with L and consequently H commutes with L minus and L minus lowers the value of M. So you um, so in other words H on L minus and LM is going to be uh, the same as L minus and LM. Whoops. H and LM. And that is E and L. Um, well, in general, would be E N L M L minus N L M, and this uh, this tells us then that L minus on N L M has the eigenvalue E N L M, but this is also since L minus is proportional to the, in other words, L minus on N L M is h bar complicated square root n l n minus 1 and so cons canceling the square roots we get h on n l n minus 1 is e n l m n l n minus 1 and I'm using this to do that and this to do that and that tells us then that um, but we would also say that H on N L N minus one would be E N L N minus one N L N minus one. And 
So we have then this ENLM equals ENLM minus 1. So E can only depend upon N and L. Now, in the case of hydrogen, there's another symmetry, which I don't remember what the name is. I'm not good with names. Maybe there's some name attached to it. Schwinger did some nice work with that. I don't know if he was the first. He probably wasn't the first to notice the symmetry. But he might have been. All right. Well, anyway, this is the general structure of the central potential. Now, you remember back when we did orbital angular momentum, what we found was that R, P squared psi, was what? We said, well, it's minus H bar squared over R squared D by DR, R squared D by DR on R psi plus 1 over R squared R L squared on psi. Okay. But in our case, we're going to have psi eigenvector of L squared with eigenvalue H bar squared L plus 1. And so this becomes minus H bar squared over R squared D DR. Well, maybe I should use a partial instead. Partial, partial R, R squared, partial, partial R of R psi plus H bar squared over R squared R psi. So that's what P squared is going to be. And so our total Hamiltonian equation then is going to be R H. And let me replace psi by, let me just say, psi is this NLM state. So this is then going to be P squared part, which is then minus H bar squared over R squared. Let me use this notation again. R squared D by DR on R NLM. And then plus H bar squared. Oh, I left out the L plus 1. Hey, you guys got to keep me honest here. L, L plus 1 here. In other words, the L squared, I forgot to, over R squared, R NLM. And then there's the V term. And that's V of R, R NLM. Okay, so that's our stationary state Schrodinger equation. And, of course, we expect that this then is equal to ENL R NLM. So the equation is that this is equal to all of that. So the energy times the wave function. In other words, in psi is equal to that. So R psi, which is psi of R, is equal to R NLM. And that's equal to then an R derivative, an angular momentum term, and a P. Should there be a 1 over 2 somewhere? Thank you. Right, this was P squared. And so when we actually 
go to have the Hamiltonian, we have it's P squared over 2M. There's a 2M here, and then we get that B. Yeah, that was... I think it's in the notes. Yeah, it's correct in the notes. I just wasn't using the notes. I was just bringing it up. It's always dangerous when I'm winging things. This thing. Okay, well... I'm on a blackboard. Let's see where to go. I guess I'll go to this front board here. So we know what the eigenfunctions are. Of this... Of this LL plus 1 term R. That is to say, what I've been writing here as... Let me just follow the notes. We're going to say that R, NLM, is going to be some RNL of R times the YLM of theta and T. And we saw in our notes on orbital angle momentum that L squared NLM was minus H bar squared 1 over sine squared theta dT squared plus 1 over sine theta d theta sine theta d theta all by acting on R NLM. And since R NLM is this, and there are no R derivatives here, this is equal to minus H bar squared R NL of R times 1 over sine squared theta dT squared plus 1 over sine theta d by d theta sine theta d by d theta acting on YLM of theta and T. And we also saw in our notes on angular momentum that L3 or LZ NLM, which is of course H bar M R NLM, is going to be H bar M R NL of R YLM. There are two conventions, both L and M lower and L and M upper. I don't know which is a better convention. And this is H bar of I d by d phi of R NL of R YLM of theta and phi. So we fix the, we get the phi dependence right from this last equation. And that tells us that we have, in other words, minus I d by d phi of YLM of theta and phi is equal to M YLM of theta and phi. And so what we do is we, we're going to be saying that we're going to be saying that 
Well, with the dependence of YLM upon... Here, let me skip a couple of things. In other words, we solve this by saying that YLM of theta and T is some PLM of theta e to the IM of B. So that satisfies this equation. Then, once we ensure that we have this, and we substitute into this equation, what's left is M squared over sine squared theta YLM. Let me leave out the theta T. Minus 1 over sine theta T theta sine theta D theta YLM. Is equal to L plus 1 YLM. This does involve any derivatives with respect to T. And so when we pop this in, effectively, this just becomes the same equation with a P here, a P there, and a P there. And that's the equation for the associated Legendre functions. And so, all together, then, what happens is that YLM of theta and T equal to minus 1 to the M, which is a convention, a big square root, 2L plus 1 over 4 pi, L minus M factorial over L plus M factorial, PLM of cosine theta E to the IM T. So, in other words, this script L has a square root in it, a minus 1 to a certain power, and then it's this associated Legendre function. And that associated Legendre function, it turns out, well, we're sort of at the end of the hour, but let me write it down for you. PLM of X, where X is cosine theta, is 1 minus X squared to the M over 2 times the M's derivative with respect to X of the Legendre polynomial. And these Legendre polynomials are just 1X and then another 1X squared. Anyway, they're simple polynomials. So, in fact, there's a nice formula due to Rodriguez for this PL. PL of X is minus 1 to the L over 2 to the L, L factorial, PL, the X to the L, 1 minus X squared to the L. So that's the nice formula there. And the reason for these crazy square roots is that so YLM integrated over the unit sphere is unity, or that they're also normal over the unit sphere. All right, so let's quit. Any questions? All right, why don't you take a few seconds from, yeah.